So I'm going to start the recording for everyone. And yeah, it looks like 6.02, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everybody to the November general meeting of Space Coast Audubon. So lovely to see um, so many of you all again. Um, during the meeting portion, if you wouldn't mind please muting your phones, that will uh, eliminate some background noise. And if anyone forgets, then I'll ask Megan, who's going to be helping me with technical support, to go ahead and mute you guys. Um, but we are delighted to see everyone. Looks like everyone um, everyone looks bright and cheery, so hopefully you guys have been doing some some birding getting out there. It's been so beautiful here in Florida. We've got some folks from California, New Hampshire, Colorado is what I've seen so far, maybe some more. Um, so um, for anyone who, I don't think there's anyone on the call I don't know, but just in case I don't, um, I am Rochelle Hood. I am the vice president of the chapter. Um, our president, Jim Stahl, is with us today. He is um, on um, audio only. You won't see his video, but you'll hear his voice a little bit here and there. So I'll be taking care of most things tonight. Um, and speaking of what we're going to be doing tonight, so we have a little bit of chapter business to take care of, um, and that will be the election of our officers. Um, so we, um, I'll explain how we're going to do that in just a minute. Um, then Bert's going to talk about the next upcoming field trip and um, perhaps share some highlights of the ones that have just occurred, answer any questions related to field trips, and then I'll share some um, information about our December and January meeting um, details, and then, you know, sit back in your chairs, grab some popcorn, get a good beverage, because we have a fant fantastic, phenomenal presentation for you today. I'm so excited that if there is an upside to COVID, it means that we get to travel to exotic places sitting on our own chair while we're enjoying things. Um, so first things first, we're going to go through our election. Um, and as far as the election procedures go, let me explain how we're going to execute this in the time of that we're in. So um, I am going to flip off this screen and go back to the video screen in a minute. And you will have one of three ways to vote. So I'll take a look to see if there's anybody on audio only. If there is, then I will make a yay or nay call from, from people who are on, only on audio. For those of you who are on video, um, I will ask you to physically raise your hand if you can to say if you vote for yes. Um, or if for those of you who are Zoom savvy, um, you can go to the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on if you have a smart device or if you have a, a desktop or laptop. The little navigation bar that comes up has something called reactions. When you see reactions, there's a little thing that you can raise the hand and it will show in the corner. Um, so that's the way we're going to execute. That's two of the ways, sorry, audio, show, raising your hand or sitting your reaction, or if none of those work or you're, if you are connected but you don't want to be on video, you can find the chat but button and say, I vote yes, or I vote, I vote I or yes, or I vote nay. Um, so that's how the process is going to work. Um, let me first remind everybody that the election is open to members only. So we have some amazing guests go joining us today. Uh, we're so happy that you could be here, but we will let, remind you that you're not able to, to participate in the election itself. And also, um, once I jump back to the other screen, the first thing I'll be doing is open up the um, floor for any nominations. Um, so if in fact we have a nomination, then I'm going to come back to this screen so that I can change any of the open positions to indicate if, uh, who will be running for that with any nominations from the floor. And then we would have to take an extra step to count the votes individually for that position or positions if we have floor nominations. <sighs> So that's the elections. Um, before I start the elections, let me first get back to the other screen so I can see all of you. And just ask, I'll review. Does anyone have any questions about the election process before I actually execute it? Shake your heads and Megan, if you can help me in case I miss anybody. I'm just scrolling through, we have so many people. Uh, looks like no. All right, so 
Since we don't, let me then go back to the uh, full view here. Um, so let me call for, does anyone have a floor nomination for any of the four positions, president, vice president, treasurer, or secretary that are up of someone that they would like to nominate themselves or someone else? Do I hear any nominations? Uh, and Megan, if you could come off mute if you're on mute and go to the chat window and let me know if you see anything in chat. So let me just give this another minute. I'm looking. I don't see anything in the chat. Nothing in chat. I hear nothing and I see no one raising their hands. So we will officially indicate that we have no floor nominations. Um, all right, let me jump back. All right, so the candidates that we have available for you is Jim Stahl returning once again as our president. So he's running for president again. I am hoping to be reelected to my position of vice president. Jeff Lamont um, will be running as our treasurer and Deborah Longman Marion as our secretary. So uh, let me stop sharing get off the screen, get back to full screen. Okay, so I would like to vote for this cast of the slate of candidates. All in favor, please raise your hand or give your thumbs up on the thing. All right, so keep your hands up. I'm gonna do a screenshot so I have that. All right, and for anybody who I see no video on, uh, for those of you on audio, would you let, let me say I or nay whether or not you approve this? Those on audio, please say I or nay now. Aye. Aye. Okay. And is there anyone opposed? So if everyone wants to clear their screen, who's got their thumbs up or down, let me see if there's any anyone opposed to this slate of officers. All right. Megan, anything in the chat? Nope. Okay. She's shaking her head. No. Okay. It's my pleasure to welcome and congratulate our 2021 board of officers. Um, thank you all for the elections and thank you all for the board for willing your willingness to serve. Um, all right. Let me go back. Whoops. Let me go back and reshare uh, my screen. Now that we're done with that. Um, yeah, I was going to make it really exciting if we had floor nominations. Okay, so with this, um, I am going to turn it over to Bert, who is our film trip director, who will tell you about the next upcoming field trip that we have coming up and also some highlights from the previous one. Bert, over to you. And Bert, I don't hear you yet, so you might be on mute still. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> I heard myself very well. <laughs> so the uh, past trips that we had, um, we did Vieira Wetlands and we got to the gate and unfortunately the volunteer didn't show up that morning and we weren't able to get in. But um, I happen to know someone that uh, has the key to 100 Acre Hollows. So uh, the five of us that uh, stuck around, we went over there and we uh, had a very successful birding trip over there. So we were able to uh, uh, salvage that one. The next trip uh, in November was at Sebastian Inlet. And um, that was a very successful one. We had uh, uh, two groups going out. Megan Berg helped, helped me. And I took the one group. We started on the south side of the inlet. And Megan started on the north side. And then after an hour, we switched sides. And it was uh, uh, a very fun trip. It was very windy that day and uh, had a lot of magnificent frigate birds flying over. So um, just a, a good overall event. Now tomorrow we have um, another event at Orlando Wetlands Park. And this one got, I started out with only 11 attendees. Um, I'm not able to go to that one. Mark Wallace is gonna be the leader. We had so many people signing up and the wait list was growing. And so Wayne Archer volunteered to be a second trip leader. And so we have two groups leading that um, activity. We're keeping our, our trips to a leader and 10 at, um, attendees um, due to all the COVID. And we're also following the uh, COVID protocols that we've established where everyone wears a mask. We do our best to uh, maintain the social distancing and um, we have uh, supplies available. We ask 
um, you know, everyone wear the masks. Um, and so that, that's been going very well. The other two trips that I've got planned going forward, December 19th. Okay, I'm gonna go now then. Sorry? Okay, sorry, that was Deborah. Deborah, um, can you put yourself on mute, please? Okay, okay go ahead, Bert. Yep, so the two trips we got coming up, uh, Vieira Wetlands on uh, December 19th. And we'll, we'll start that one at nine o'clock. So they, um, ho hopefully we'll be able to get into the gate uh, this time. And then on December 27th, we'll do a, a trip to Crookshank. Um, so that'll be a, a nice local one also. And then as we're watching everything going on with the, the COVID activities, and if there's any uh, additional restrictions, obviously we'll keep that in mind. Uh, if things open up a little bit better, then we'll, we'll also uh, uh, um, adjust for that. A uh, couple other things I wanna bring up. Uh, the first weekend in December, uh, the December 3rd to the 7th, the North Shore Birding Festival is uh, going on. This is up at Lake Apopka. The field trips are, are filling up quickly. They have a lot of really great trips at Lake Apopka. And my understanding is there's a groove built Ani out, out at Lake Apopka. So if anyone needs that for their life list, uh, this would be a great opportunity to uh, get out there. That, that I've seen that on, the Ani's out there uh, on a couple of different trips uh, with the North Shore Birding Festival. So hopefully the Ani will stick around and, and the leaders will be able to find it. Um, also currently going on is Feeder Watch. So, and we've got a link for that on our meetup site. So anyone that's interested in that, please go ahead and do that. We'll also be having the Christmas bird count uh, coming up, I believe. I, um, so I'll, I'll defer that to uh, um, uh, someone that I, I think Denise and or... Um, I have an update I'll share on that, Bert, when you're done. Okay, okay great. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is in September of next year, I'll be going up to Maine for Hog Island. Uh, there's a uh, four or five day trip up there. Anyone that's interested in doing that, please contact me. That's a Holbrook tri trip and I'll get you involved in it and get the information to you so that if you wanna go, you can join us. Uh, that should be a fun and exciting trip. My first trip up to New England, so I, I'm really excited for that one. Excuse me, what, what month and day was that? For Hog Island? Yes, please. Uh, it's in September. I'll uh, Give me a moment and I'll, I'll look Oh, up. September of next year. Yeah, September of 2021. Okay, thank you. And Steve, if you'd like, we'd be happy to send you some details. I'll, I'll make a note that you were interested in that and I'll ask Bert to send you some details. Yeah, and so that's all I've got. If there's any questions, um, it's actually the the last. It starts at the end of August and goes into the beginning of September. So, um, but yeah, let let me know if you want want the information, and we'll get that out to you. All right, thanks, Bert. Um, so, uh, just a quick note: Kate contacted me last night. Kate uh, serves as our education director, and she also has assumed responsibility uh, for the South Brevard Christmas bird count. Um, she's working tonight, so she couldn't join us, but she wanted to let me know that um, she had contacted all of the group, the the leaders in the South Brevard bird count. They're all willing to go forward with it, and um, the. The leaders all had, um, all of the Florida leaders had a call yesterday, an, an additional call besides the, the National Audubon one that had occurred before that. Um, they've come back with some additional guidance on the way in which it can be run um, and some potential additional restrictions like not letting new people in, groups have to be pods only, that type of thing. So uh, we were hoping to announce the rest of the details today, but they have to go back and do a rethink of how they might orchestrate this based on the new um, instructions that were given yesterday. 
So I just wanted to let everyone know once we get kind of a final indication from both that bird count, the refuge one, and also um, the uh, cocoa count, uh, we will send, we'll put notifications on Meetup either way, whether it's a go and no go, or it's not open for additional registration, or it's individuals only. But what we do know is that they will definitively not be a gathering for, um, usually there's a dinner at most of these, or coming together to compile the results. That will not occur this year. Um, and there's a chance that some of the counts won't be ran the way that they normally on, and they might just make it a like people bird on their own and report up. So I'm, I'm very sorry that we still don't have the final information, but because this was some additional changes yesterday, uh, we need to sort of step back, take a look at that, talk about that, and then get that back to you guys. So I probably can't ask, <laughs> is there any questions? Because that's what I got relayed from Kate. But I will say, is there anything else that anybody would like to share about the Christmas bird counts or any further updates? Or Jim, and do you, if you happen to have any updates related to the refuge count? <clears throat> Nothing on that, but um, uh, to begin with, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our second uh, virtual meeting of the year and greatly thank Rochelle for using her personal uh, Zoom uh, setup for hosting it and also for the great programs she's put together for us for this year. Just a little bit about the refuge. Uh, the ducks are coming back. There were 12 different species there yesterday. The water levels out there are still very high. No habitat to speak of for the shorebirds, but the ducks are slowly coming back. I don't think we'll have the numbers we've had 10, 20 years ago, partly due to uh, climate change. Uh, many of the ducks just are not coming this far south anymore, but there is a nice number of uh, species out there. If you have a chance to go out, and look around. Uh, two specialties out there, there's a Franklin skull, that's uh, staying on the causeway, the Titusville Causeway right now. It's mixed in with the uh, laughing gulls. It's very hard to tell them apart, but there is one nice adult uh, Franklin skull mixed in with the uh, laughing gulls there on the causeway. And our cinnamon tail came back. It's in the very same spot it was last year. It's been there for several days now, and hopefully it's going to spend the entire winter there. And uh, that's all I have to say. So. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I know a couple of people went out for that Franklin Skull. I know Susan and I are going out tomorrow. So um, I hope anyone else has had some luck trying to get that. I, I saw some. Uh, I went two days ago to find the cinnamon teal when he wasn't date where he was normally. So maybe he was taking a nap. But try again tomorrow. Um, where all right. Is cinnamon teal? Where, where is, was it last year and where is it this year, more importantly? <laughs> Um, so, um, the, gosh, Jim, what's the stop number? So when you go to where you, the first place that you can pull off to do parking and the trail that we have adopted, the Space Coast Wild Birds Unlimited Trail, uh, where it's the Space Coast Audubon Trail that we pick up the trash on, if you walk down there to the second overlook, um, it's, it's in that pond by that overlook. Thank you. Yeah, once you make... get to the first blind that's on your right continue on down the path and starting at the first blind from there on down to the second blind it could be anywhere in the uh, canal or the uh, pond on the left hand side of the trail great thank you thanks all right any other questions any other comments before we go on to a few other announcements okay and well, so then let me just talk about the upcoming meetings. So for those of you who didn't join us last month, um, since we can't all um, get on an airplane the way that we'd like to sometimes, I decided that we would take the opportunity to go around to some wonderful places while we're doing virtual. So we started with Costa Rica in October. Today, you're going to hear all about that in just a minute, about we're going to Papua New Guinea. Um, next month, uh, I'm excited to hear that one of our birder, an actual birder from from this group who is now um, located physically in Alaska. Um, he is going to come back and present for us about birding in Alaska and he's going to be doing live from Alaska. Um, so join us um, next month for that. Also, just to let everybody know, next month uh, we started last year doing something a little bit different where 
because we don't want to be close to the holidays and our normal cycle would fall, um, you know, right as the week close to Christmas, we're doing it the first Friday of the month to try to stay away from all holiday activities. So please note that the December meeting will actually be on December 4th. The other thing that's different about it is that at the conclusion of the presentation, then we will stay on for extended chat. So last year, you might recall, I had chips, chirps, and cheer. So there's probably a game in your future. So um, get your game shoes on, bring your holiday gear and sweaters and that kind of stuff, dress up for that, um, and stay on the line after the presentation if you'd like to enjoy some holiday cheer with our birding buddies. Then we open the new year um, with right now we're still planning to be virtual um, in the event that that changes, of course, we'll let you know. Um, the speaker is available for virtual or live because we have um, Becky Bolt, who has been an environmental bio, um, environmentalist at the um, refuge uh, on, on the Space Center, sorry, um, for 30, I think she's 32 years now. So she's got a fascinating program that talks about um, basically rockets and birds coexisting. So we're calling it balancing technology and nature. So it's quite an interesting experience for 30 years of being there, of trying to maintain habitat while, while, while going forward with the mission of launching rockets and doing that even more often than ever before at this point. So please do join us back January 15th for that. And then also, just to let you know, for February, we're going to have a fascinating presentation from somebody who's done some extensive research about um, Purple Martins. So uh, we'll have that in February, um, and then we'll kind of update you at that point what that looks like, where that's going to be, if it's on Zoom or in person. Um, so that one's another one where they can drive down if, in fact, that's where we are at the point. So mark your calendars, and of course, this will all be on Meetup, and you can sign up there. And if it's on Zoom, it'll be the same process where you have to register before it sends you the, the details. So now let's get to the good stuff. Let's go to paradise on a Friday night. Um, I just wanted to say I'm just delighted to have um, Adam joining us tonight. Um, so uh, you can see his bio there, but he's had quite an experience. He currently works for Rock Jumper and has been a freelance guide for over 20 years. Um, he's worked on all kinds of different conservation programs, and he also has on his list one of the birds I was meant to see this year, the spoon-billed sandpiper. I had a trip scheduled to go see that with my Oriental Bird Club. So, uh, so he is my envy as a result of that. But um, I, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Adam to the stage. Um, Adam, would you like to say hello? And then we'll go ahead and switch screen sharing over to you. Right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on for this uh, chat. And thanks to Rochelle for inviting me and for the introduction as well. And I'll just uh, get a full screen here. Here we go. So um, yeah, my name's uh, Adam Wallin. Uh, Rochelle basically summed it up there. I work for a Rock Jumper Birding Adventures. Uh, we've been around for over 20 years and um, run uh, birding and wildlife tours uh, all, all around the world. And myself, I've been a guide for about 20 years as well. And um, <clears throat> for the past 10 years or so, I've led tours to New Guinea uh, almost uh, almost every year there. I also lead tours through Southeast Asia um, and Central and South America and all over the place. Um, so yeah, I wanna take you uh, tonight here on a virtual tour of uh, New Guinea, which is uh, one of our most uh, exotic and, and also popular destinations uh, at Rock Jumper. So, uh, just to quickly show you on the world map here, I've got my laser. So I'm circling it here, kind of right in the center. So this is the island of New Guinea, and it's situated in the South Pacific and just north of Australia. And here, zooming in on it. Um, so it is, in fact, the world's second largest island, and it's actually shaped like a bird. So we're off to a good start there with the, with the head, um, right here, with the head the bird's head and, and the bird's tail. Um, the dominant feature of New Guinea is this uh, central range of mountains that runs right along the backbone of the country. And it includes peaks of up to almost 5,000 meters and even some glaciated, uh, glaciated peaks, although sadly those are kind of uh, melting. But um, it does have the highest mountains of, of any island in the world as well. 
Um, so that central, central mountains is certainly the, the dominant feature of the island, but the majority of, of the landmass of the island is it's a tropical lowland forest to the north and to the south um, as well. And uh, so that covers mo most of New Guinea is actually a tropical lowland rainforest. Now, uh, people uh, first arrived here about 50,000 years ago, um, but it's sort of only come into Western contact, obviously much more recent. And there remain to this day's um, significant areas of New Guinea that have never been explored or, or documented mm, good. in Western science. Good. It's probably the most rugged island. Leave it that way. Probably the most rugged <laughs> island that we have um, uh, in in the world, and for that reason, it's uh, uh, very few roads. And what's happened is that um, it's become very tribal. Um, in that um, tribes have developed in valleys, and over over these fifty thousand years, have had very little contact with each other. And the result of that is we now see the place with probably the greatest cultural diversity in the world. And so you can see the ruggedness of the terrain in the back there, but these are the Huli Wigmen and all of these tribes have, you know, elaborate um, rituals, you know, uh, costumes and um, in particular languages. So um, the, one of the many remarkable things about Papua New Guinea is that it has about 865 documented languages. And so that's about 20% of the world's languages in just this one island. And um, so neighboring tribes cannot really understand each other with, with their native languages and um, yeah, have totally different customs and, and dress. And that's one of the really neat things about traveling around New Guinea. So you can see here, um, again, the Huli Wigmen, they actually wear wigs made of human hair adorned with all these different um, birds of paradise feathers. And this was uh, one of the other highland tribes near Garoka, and they have different species of bird of paradise, different paints, and uh, some cassowary feathers in there as well. And then this is one of the coastal tribes, which are totally different again. But we see this as we move through New Guinea, um, this, this amazing cultural diversity. But again, best exemplified by, by the fact that 20% of the world's languages are found in New Guinea. So politically, um, there's actually two countries here. So the island itself is called New Guinea. The eastern, uh, pardon me, the western half is Indonesian and we, we call that West Papua. The eastern half is the country of Papua New Guinea itself. So that's a bit confusing. We got New Guinea and Papua New Guinea and my talk is gonna be about the, the eastern half of the island, Papua New Guinea. And here's the country. So again, the eastern half of New Guinea and Papua New Guinea as well includes uh, a number of large islands like New Britain, and New Ireland and, and many others. I'm not gonna be talking about those, but those islands do also have many other endemic and interesting birds. Um, but I'll be talking about the main, the main land of Papua New Guinea. And um, just quickly biogeographically here, this will be my last map for a while, but we see that um, the island of New Guinea has close affinities with Australia. So in between is this very shallow seas. So at many times in the past, um, they've actually been connected by land bridges. So while, they're, while it's an island today, it, it's often been connected to Australia. And so it shares its biological affinities with, uh, with Australia. So even though it, some of these islands of Indonesia are actually physically closer, um, they, they're, um, they were never connected. There are much deeper water in between there. And so this area called Wallacea is a, a totally different biological realm. And again, separated um, Wallacea from the famous Wallace's line which is the Sunda realm. So you have three really completely different biological realms all close together, but the area we're looking at, New Guinea, is, is essentially Australasian. But we're here um, to talk about the birds. And um, New Guinea is often regarded as having the most, sorry, New Guinea is often regarded as having sort of the most spectacular assemblage of birds um, in the world. And um, the island has over 700 species of birds and so most of any island in the world, but um, it's the uniqueness of the birds that are really special here. And that's um, shown in the fact that there are seven endemic families. So quite extraordinary that a single island has seven endemic families. Um, but what uh, New Guinea is best well known for with its birds are the birds of paradise. And uh, New Guinea has 39 of the world's 43 species of birds of paradise. 
Uh, so it, it's not the only place with birds of paradise, but almost all of the birds of paradise are only found in New Guinea. And so before we kind of start to look at the birds, it is worth asking the question, why are the birds so weird and wonderful in New Guinea? Um, why are they so different? And there's a few reasons for that. Firstly, uh, New Guinea is the largest tropical island in the world. So islands are often evolutionary experiments and especially so tropical ones. Um, another important factor is that this Australasian region is actually where uh, passerines or songbirds are kind of known to have evolved. And, uh, and so it's, there's been a long period of time here when strange things can evolve. Um, there's an inordinate amount of flowering and especially fruiting trees in New Guinea. So birds are actually able to find food more easily than they are elsewhere. So they can devote energy and time to doing other things. And there's also relatively few uh, predators for birds. So you put all those together in a cocktail and you give it a long time. And um, we've ended up with what we have today in New Guinea, which is kind of the most incredible assemblage of birds in the world. And um, just bear those concepts in mind as, as we look at the birds. Okay, so I want to take you on a virtual tour of our uh, our uh, birding in paradise tour that we that we do with Rock Jumper, which is a, an 18 day tour. And we start out here in the southeast peninsula. That's this bird's tail. And we start out here in Port Moresby. So Port Moresby is the capital of New Guinea. It's a, a large modern city. And um, we spend a few days in the area. Some varied habitats around Port Moresby. The dominant habitat is actually eucalyptus forest, very much like you would encounter in, uh, in Australia. And indeed, the birds are very similar um, around in these eucalyptus forests to what you would see in, in parts of Queensland, Australia. Blue-winged kookaburra is, uh, is a common species, as is uh, rainbow bee eater. And Papuan frogmouth is very large nocturnal bird. And we normally, while we do sometimes see them at night, we more often find them sleeping, uh, but they're very well camouflaged. So you need a, a keen eye to spot these uh, sleeping on a branch, but very impressive bird. Now, one of the special birds in the Port Moresby area is the fawn-breasted bowerbird. And bowerbirds are a very interesting Australasian family of birds. Most of them are rather drab like this bird. Um, I'll show you one of the brighter ones at the end of the talk. But most of them are, are fairly drab, but what's really remarkable about this bird is the structures they build, which are the bowers. And um, so the bower has nothing to do with the nest. The nest is, is a completely separate thing. The bower is built by the male, and it's built to attract the female's attention. And uh, he'll also often do a display around the bower once he attracts the female there. So um, Again, because bowerbirds are fruit-eating birds, they can easily find a lot of fruit. So they actually have time and energy to devote to other things. And in the case of bowerbirds, they, uh, they've funneled this into building the most remarkable structures that any bird builds in the bird world. And so this was the fawn-breasted bowerbirds bower, which is one of the kind of standard bowers or avenue bowers, as we call them. And he likes to adorn them with green things. As you see there, he's put a couple of green fruits and some green leaves there but it reaches its uh, most extraordinary with the Huan Bowerbird. And you probably can't tell the, the size of this bower, but I could fit my whole body in that hut. So they actually build like basically a hut and then, um, then they put piles of different colored things around. So different uh, fruits, fungi, and the purple thing you see just under the entrance of the hut, those are actually beetle carapaces. So beetle, beetle shells that are all of the same color. And so, I mean, th it, this is an extraordinary thing for a bird to do, just to spend so much time building a bower like this. And it, again, he does it strictly to attract a female um, so that she'll come in and, and hopefully decide to mate with him. Um, so yeah, birding the Port Marsby area, really varied habitats, um, some wetlands in the area as well. So we see the, the lily trotting, comb crested jicanas, and in the grasslands, we have um, other birds as well, like these endemic gray-headed mannequins, which is an endemic finch that uh, follows around flowering uh, grass. But uh, the main birding destination around Port Moresby is Varirata National Park. So almost all of New Guinea and all of Melanesia in general is actually privately owned. Even the most sort of remote mountain peaks are all privately owned. Um, but this was one case where uh, there is some public land and it's actually the first national park that was put together in New Guinea. 
And so uh, when we head there, we normally head straight for the lek of the Ragiana bird of paradise. And this is the emblem of, of Papua New Guinea. And this is, I think, what most of us are thinking of when, when we think of New Guinea. So why bird of paradise? Um, so the name comes, the first skins that were shipped to Europe from, from New Guinea didn't have legs on them. The legs have been removed. And the story went that these birds, these weren't birds or what they, they didn't have legs and they had descended from heaven. So they were called the birds of paradise. So obviously that's not true. The legs had just been removed. But what birds of paradise really are is, is actually more fascinating. They're actually uh, quite closely re related to the crows, if you can believe that. But they are uh, a family of birds that are only found in Australasia. So in, in New Guinea and a little bit into Australia and Eastern Indonesia. But what's remarkable about, about them is that they've sort of uh, have the most extravagant plumage of any birds in the world. They're, let's say, the weirdest looking birds that we have in the world. And not only that, um, are they so much different to all other birds, but within the family, within the family, there's such an extraordinary range of, of um, colors and, and, and feather patterns. And so they've achieved this diversity through two ways. One is by modifying their feathers, like you see this bird with those crazy back plumes and different wires. Those are all just different feathers that have, they've just modified to look totally different. And then also they can transform themselves into different shapes. So this is what um, the bird looks kind of when it's, when it's in the forest. And then it can flip upside down and flare out all these colors and just turn itself into a completely different creature when it's displaying. So this is the Ragiana bird of paradise and we'll visit a lek where there's several males. And then once the females turn up, uh, the males start displaying. And uh, again, with all the fruiting trees around there, again, that's what's the theory is that's what's fueled this crazy diversity in the birds of paradise is, is so much fruit around. Um, there's also an amazing array of other frugivorous birds. These are all different fruit doves and, and you can see all of these in a, in a day or two of birding around Verirata and, and just spectacular colors and, and, and diversity. It's certainly the, the pigeon and dove uh, capital of the world. And it's also um, a great diversity of parrots such as the black cap lorry. That's a female eclectus parrot on the right. So uh, pigeons and, and parrots are, are abundant and diverse in New Guinea. And um, inside the forest, we'll be looking for mixed, uh, mixed flocks of songbirds. And one species that's quite dominant there is this bird called the hooded pitahui, another remarkable bird in that it's a poisonous bird. So New Guinea has the only poisonous birds in the world. Um, the poison in them is a batrachotoxin. So that's actually the same compound that you'll find in the poison dart frogs from Central and South America. And it's not that they're born with the poison in them. They acquire it by eating a certain type of blister beetle. So not all of them, not all of the individuals are poisonous, but most of them are because they eat this beetle. And there's also anecdotal evidence that the birds themselves can eat too many of the beetles and, uh, and actually poison themselves as well. But um, it seems to be a good strategy for the hooded pitahui. They're one of the loudest and most common birds in, um, in the area, probably because nobody else wants to touch them. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll spend some time on the trails in Verirata, um, see all kinds of different things like these cute white-faced robins that cling to the sides of trees, uh, the very shy uh, sooty thicket fantail. And New Guinea is also the kingfisher capital of the world. So we're used in North America, we're used to seeing these blue and white or green and white kingfishers along waterways. But uh, in New Guinea, almost all of the kingfishers are found in the forest interior. And um, so they're feeding on things like reptiles, frogs, and, and insects, and they're uh, shy forest interior birds, uh, but they're extremely colorful and varied. So a brown-headed paradise kingfisher with those long tail streamers is one of the endemic specialties that we look for. These yellow-billed kingfishers, um, we normally need to look up, up high in the, in the canopy of trees to see these. All, all the way to these tiny little dwarf kingfishers. These are only about five inches long. They're just glowing when you, when you find them in the forest. Um, to the massive kookaburras that are three times as big. You know, these are 15 inches. So uh, just an incredible diversity and array of kingfishers in the forests of New Guinea. And while we're walking the forest trails, we always hope to see some of those very elusive uh, ground birds. These, these are very shy birds that we sometimes get a chance to see like this pheasant pigeon, which is a huge 
uh, a huge brown pigeon. So it just walks around on the ground, very colorful and, and very hard to see as well. Um, forest bittern is another virtually unknown bird that um, we sometimes get to see in Verirata. So that's kind of the start to our, uh, our trip. That's kind of our introduction with a few days in Port Moresby, especially around Verirata. We then head up into the highlands. So we're heading up into this area here, right in, in kind of the center of the country. Now there's no roads up into the highlands or, or anywhere in the country for that matter. There's very few roads. So to get anywhere we fly and it gives you a good lay of the land. So you'll see here a typical highland scene. At the bottom is uh, uh, agriculture. So in the valleys here, there's an agricultural system that's been in development for over 10,000 years, completely in, in isolation to any other agricultural system in the world. And it's based on a root crops and pigs. Um, so much of the uh, intermountain valleys are, are inhabited and, and um, a lot of agriculture happening in them. The steeper slopes are still well forested, pristine mountain forest. And then the highest slope, that's Mount Gilloway in the distance there, actually have alpine grasslands. And uh, the very, very highest uh, slopes do actually have glaciers on their peaks. And on the ground, uh, you're birding in situations like this, waterfalls and uh, pandanus, tree ferns, and, and really spectacular montane forest. And despite the remoteness of the area, it's got the nicest lodges in the country. So we, say, we stay in some really comfortable lodges. This is uh, Rondon Ridge. And this is the famous Ambua Lodge in the, in the Tari Valley. And one of the lodges we stay at the Highlands called Kuma Lodge has an amazing bird feeding table out the backyard. And this is, um, this is a several foot long table that several times a day they put huge helpings of fruit on it. And the birds come from the surrounding cloud forest. It's built right in the, right in the middle of the cloud forest. And the birds come out of the forest to feed on, on the fruit. And this is a remarkable bird of paradise called the brown sicklebill. And uh, this is actually the female. And they come every day for, for a few helpings of, of fruit. And you get, you get to have some amazing opportunities to watch these. So they like the papaya. And what they do is they stab it with that long curved bill. Then they fling it up in the air. And then they open, open up their beak and, and close on the papaya. And all kinds of other shy forest birds come to the feeding table. This is the Brems tiger parrot, a colorful parrot. It actually spends a lot of its time walking around on the ground, but um, they come up to the, to the feeding table. And the surrounding gardens have a lot of other birds, uh, forest birds. They're not maybe coming right up to the feeding table, but they're very well habituated. So Rufus Nate Bellbird, for example, which is a, a bird of interest. It's in an in unusual family, and it's very shy in the forest. But here you see one just kind of hopping around on one of the, one of the cabins. And uh, New Guinea is also very well represented in honey eaters, um, most of which feed on flowering trees. Some of them come to eat at the fruit as well, like these spectacular smoky honey eaters. And this is all the same species. So they can actually change their face from uh, yellow to red almost in an instant by shunting blood or taking it back. So I think it seems when they get angry, when there's another bird trying to steal their fruit, they suddenly go red and then, then they turn yellow again. That's really neat to see. But a great diversity of, uh, of honey eaters, mainly, uh, mainly feeding on the flowering trees in the area. And also lorikeets, a spectacular poplin lorikeet. You see its tail going off the bottom of the screen there. And um, these are, this one's also feeding on nectar. So this is a Scheffler plant, which is probably the best bird, bird food plant in New Guinea. If we see flowering or fruiting Scheffler, as we know, we're gonna see something fun. I mean, you can see it using its brush tongue to, uh, to feed on the nectar of the Schefflera. And even some mammals come to the feeding table. Um, New Guinea actually has a lot of mammals, but most of them are, are shy and nocturnal and obscure and uh, folks don't know much about them. But we do get to see some sometimes coming around the feeding tables like this speckled dacier. And this is actually a marsupial carnivore and some rodents, like uh, this is a moss forest rat that climbed up on my shoulder. And um, probably the most remarkable bird that comes to the feeding table is a ribbon-tailed Astrapia. And uh, you can see him there with a chunk of pineapple in his foot. And a spectacular bird already, you see with the iridescent green and the pom-pom, but the remarkable thing about the ribbon-tailed Astrapia is its tail. And here we go. The tail is uh, three times the length of the body. 
So it's got the longest tail to body ratio of any bird in the world. And they flutter the tail when they fly. They often fly over the forest um, in a display flight and they flutter the tail, it ripples and you can hear it whooshing. And that's just, I mean, that's a remarkable experience to, uh, to get to experience that. Okay, so apart from the lodge grounds, um, we do spend a lot of time in the, in the high mountain forests. And these, um, these sort of mid elevation to high elevation forests are where the bulk of the birds of paradise are. And again, it's just worth considering the great diversity of um, within the family, how different, they're all spectacular, but all in different ways. So blue bird of paradise is one of the most stunning species. Everyone always wants to see this. And um, for their display, they actually flip upside down. This is the black sickle bill with, see that very long tail and long curved bill. And this one's call is so loud. That's his song post there that he's sitting on. And you can hear this one from two or three miles away. Superb bird of paradise is one of the most spectacular for sure with that um, turquoise breast shield. And the Stephanie's Astrapia, another one with remarkable long tails. And you can often see all of these species um, coming together in, in the right fruiting tree. And you can see several species at the same time coming around or early in the morning when they're, when they're displaying. Uh, one of the real special uh, birds of paradise is the King of Saxony. And uh, it's got that striking color pattern you can't quite see, but it's got a neon green inside the mouth, which you can often actually see in the field when it's calling like that. But uh, obviously the crazy thing about these are their, are their head wires. And so those are actually two feathers and they're just two modified feathers sticking out of the back of the head and they're incredibly long. They actually feel like plastic. Um, they're just like nothing else in, in the bird world. And, um, but the males often do sit up on a prominent perch like this and, and they have a mechanical call and uh, you can watch them singing. And we have the lesser bird of paradise as well in, in this area. And I've always thought this was a terrible name for the bird. There's nothing, uh, nothing lesser about the bird at all. So the highlands is really where we get this incredible diversity of the birds of paradise. So that always is a, a real focal point of our time there. Um, but probably equally important, this is where all of those seven endemic families of birds occur. And we try and find um, all of them. So these are, are really unique birds. Um, this is a crested berry pecker. So from the, from the crested berry pecker family, a fruit eating bird. This is a remarkable one from a monotypic family called the wattled plowbill got those pink wattles, um, which the function of it remains unknown. There's still so much we don't know about the birds of New Guinea. And this is another uh, monotypic family called the ifrit, the blue-capped ifrit. And it creeps around on tree trunks, much like a nuthatch. And uh, the, the, one of the local names for the bird up there is ifrit. That's where the name comes from. But ifrit means demon. And that's because it's another one of these poisonous birds. So um, yeah. Doesn't, uh, doesn't look it, but uh, it is a little demon. And the satin birds are another intriguing endemic family. These are plump uh, fruit eating birds. They're hard to spot, but once you do find them, they just kind of sit around in the fruiting trees all, all day and you can get some really spectacular views of these. I, I love the crested satin birds color pattern and those two little cones in his head as well. He only sticks those up rarely when he's uh, displaying. Another one. And then, um, you know, as, as in so many mountainous parts of the world, the, the general birding is, is just great. There's always something to look at, be it uh, great wood swallows soaring overhead, the perky little white shouldered fairy wrens along the roadsides. Um, this is a spectacular honey eater called the red colored myzomela with some flowering bushes. Tiny little pygmy parrots. These things are three inches long, so they're about this big and they creep up and down the trees. And uh, if we're lucky, the Papuan harpy eagle, which is um, the apex predator. And we'll also um, head inside the forest onto, onto forest trails while we're up in the highlands. You can see um, it's quite a closed in scenario. So birding can be a wee bit tricky in there, but it's a magical experience to get inside of the cloud forest in places the moss will be a, a foot thick on the branches. And it's just, uh, it's just a real great experience, um, no matter what we see for the birds. 
but these uh, friendly fantails always come and come and check us out when we head inside the forest and they really are quite friendly fluttering around us. Uh, Regent Whistler is a spectacular uh, bird in the in the bird parties inside the forest. And uh, many species of robins as well, often hopping on the ground like this uh, confiding white winged robin or garnet robin, which is a trickier one to find. And um, you know, so while we're inside the forest, we're always uh, hoping to see some of these elusive ground birds. This is another one of the endemic families in New Guinea, the melampittas. There's only two species, and um, they're just basically all black pitta-like birds that hop around on the ground. Um, so they they're quite tricky to find, but we do regularly get to see them. And this is another special one, the popwin log runner, which normally is very hard to see, but you know, in New Guinea, there's always going to be a surprise or two. One day we just had these, they were just walking around us for like half an hour. And normally they're very hard to see, but, you know, we say it's the land of expect the unexpected. And, uh, and that's why you know, I've, I've done 20 plus trips there, but every trip I see something totally new that just kind of leaves me bewildered at how that happened. And that's, that's one of the real joys of traveling around in New Guinea. And um, yeah, if we still have energy after, after a long day's birding, there's always options to go out owling. Um, we usually stay pretty close to the lodges for, for the owling. Um, looking for Papuan Bubak is, is probably the most common owl in the region. This is a rare, uh, poorly known nightjar called Archbold's nightjar. And, uh, but what we're really hoping to see um, in our nocturnal sessions are the owlet nightjars. So this is another very special New Guinea family. They're not owls and they're not nightjars. Um, in fact, they're more closely related to the swifts, if you can believe that. But they're basically tiny little uh, nocturnal birds. They're very hard to find because they're well camouflaged. Um, they don't call a lot. Um, so they're, they're tricky to find, but we do usually spend some time looking for them and often get to see um, some of the owlet nightjar species. So this is the mountain owlet nightjar. And this is my favorite one, the feline owlet nightjar. And you see those cat-like whiskers. Just amazing. And uh, again, New Guinea with, with all these sort of intermontane tribes is, is really the, uh, the cultural diversity hotspot of, of, uh, of the area. So um, while we're up in the highlands, we normally do visit a couple Sing Sings or cultural presentations. So these are the Asaro Mudmen. And uh, this is what they would do to frighten off their enemies uh, as they're going to war with them. So quite amazing. And these are a couple Huli wigmen. Uh, this is my friend Eric. And um, yeah, so the the, the Hulis, they actually grow they grow their hair and then they they form it into a wig and 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 they sell that wig and then they adorn it with uh, you can see some bird of paradise feathers and some lorikeet feathers and um, yeah. But you know, New Guinea has a bit of this raw reputation for the people being sort of rough or violent. But the truth is, I mean. For the most part, new, the Papuans are, are, are the friendliest, nicest folks you're going to meet anywhere in the world. And, uh, and it's, you know, anyone will stop and stop and have a laugh with you and, and have a talk. And that's a big part of the trip is just, just getting to hang out with, you know, not only our local guides, but just the folks we meet sort of while, while walking around uh, the villages. And, um, yeah, another thing about these highland lodges, especially the, the walls at night, if you, especially after a misty morning, sometimes these walls have like hundreds of species of moths on them. This is a Hercules moth, but it's, it's amazing the diversity of insects, uh, rhinoceros beetle. So there's so much to do in the highlands um, and incredible scenery throughout. Uh, so we do spend uh, uh, almost half of the trip up in the highlands. There's, there's a lot to see and do there. And then kind of the, the back portion of the trip we head, um, we head further west and uh, we visit the upper Fly River. So these mountains get drained by these huge rivers. Um, you see in the north, this is the Sepik River. That's a famous large river. Um, in the south, the big river is the Fly River. This one that goes all the way down. And it's one of the largest rivers in the world. And um, so we concentrate on sort of the top region of it um, into the foothills where, where the mountains come down to the foothills and then right down into the, the sort of flatter lowland part, which is kind of the edge of this huge, vast, um, one of the world's last great rainforests. So the foothills are, um, are cloudy and steep, 
but um, we actually um, we're actually birding in the area of of the Octeti mine, which which at one time was the world's largest gold and copper mine. Um, so the access is, is actually relatively easy in the area. Um, and I just put this sign in, it's in both English and, uh, and Pigeon. So despite these 865 languages, virtually everybody in New Guinea speaks one language the same, and that's uh, Pigeon. So, um, when they're speaking it, they talk really fast and it, it can be hard to work out what they're saying, but when you see it written down, especially compared with English, um, you can you can work out pretty easily what, what they're about. And um, yeah, the foothills have, a, again, a completely different assemblage of birds, birds of paradise. This is another really unique, spectacular one called the magnificent bird of paradise. And um, we'll also see the Corollas protea here. And sorry, this is actually a Western protea, a closely related species. And um, you can see it's, uh, it's, it's a remarkable bird with those, those head wires in its own right. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the really crazy things birds of paradise can do is to sort of shape shift into, into a completely different shape. So I've got a short video for you. I hope it runs well. Sometimes these Zoom videos don't work well, but this is the, the protea when it comes down to the ground and displays for the female. Right, so I'll play that one more time. So this bird here transforms itself basically into a ballerina dancer and does this amazing uh, dance on the ground. So that's the protea and that's again one of the birds of paradise. Um, so yeah, the, there's some rushing rivers in the area that have Salvadori's teal, which is an endemic genera of duck only found in New Guinea. Torrent lark is another special bird in the area. Um, this particular area is one of the few sites where the obscure berry pecker occurs. I mean, it's not, it's not a dramatic bird, but it's one of so many uh, New Guinea birds that are just so very poorly known. And again, it's always exciting. Like we never know every day what, what we're going to find and, and what could be out there. And uh, the area is very good for the Pesquet's parrot, which has got to be one of the most spectacular parrots in the world with that bright red and black plumage and a huge bill, a very prehistoric parrot, actually most closely related to the Vasa parrots of Madagascar. So uh, just an, <clears throat> an ancient lineage of parrots. And uh, one of the real specialties in this area that folks always want to see is a shovel-billed kookaburra. It's actually a crepuscular or almost nocturnal kingfisher that has this huge bill. So in the late afternoons, um, we try very hard to see this, although it is quite a shy bird. Let's take a sip of water. And from the, from the foothills, we head down to the lowlands and then we visit uh, the greater bird of paradise, a lek of them. And this is kind of the quintessential bird of paradise. So this is the one that uh, Alfred Wallace, uh, you know, one of the first Westerners to ever lay eyes, the first to describe the, the birds of paradise. This was a species that, that uh, he was introduced to. Also Attenborough um, in his first birds of paradise show, it was these greater birds of paradise. And so in fact, we actually go out with the same, um, with the same guy that Attenborough used and, and the same forest. They're not in that same tree, they moved to a different tree, but um, this is sort of the, the real quintessential bird of paradise, the, the greater bird of paradise. And visiting this lek will often have 10 to 15 males up there. Um, it's quite high up they are, but um, they're up there and displaying um, for their females. And another spectacular one in the same forest is the king bird of paradise. It's one of the smallest ones and it tends to uh, be fairly high up in the canopy, but it sits quiet for a long time. So we put the, the scopes on them and usually get really good views. It's, it's one of my favorites with that striking uh, red and white color pattern. And if you can see here, I'll just point with the laser. If you can see here, it's got these little coils. So very thin tail streamer. And then it's like a, a little coiled spoon. And again, these are, these are modified feathers. So it just, it's almost endless variation that these feathers can turn into. And um, ultimately, uh, the, the trip sort of heads towards uh, a, a bit of a, a climax in ways um, with a visit down the Fly River. And this is our chance to really get out into a true wilderness where there's um, almost no people around and, um, and see the real kind of remote, the real remote New Guinea. 
And um, we head out by boats up the Fly River. And on the riverbanks early in the morning, these 12 wired bird of paradise uh, sing on these song posts, another spectacular bird of paradise, again, totally different. And uh, it's got those 12 wires. They're not actually tail wires, they're actually flank feathers. They're just, um, yeah, again, heavily modified feathers. And they've, they've got 12 of them. They, they uh, call loudly early in the morning. And if the female comes in, she'll do a very close inspection, make sure he's got all his wires in working order. And, um, and then ho hopefully they'll have a, a mating if she likes what she sees. And in this uh, quite remote area, um, there's a lot of spectacular large birds that, that we just kind of get to sit in the boats and leisurely drift by and, and watch things like palm cockatoos on the left spectacular Blythe's hornbill on the right, a variety of raptors as well, like a long-tailed honey buzzard. And um, we do spend uh, a night uh, right out in the middle of nowhere in this uh, very modest uh, hut. So this is the one night when we do kind of rough it, but most folks look back on it at, at the end of the trip as, as one of the real highlights. Uh, just going to sleep with, with the sound of the forest all around you. And it's, uh, it's a pretty special, pretty special uh, chance to, to be out in the real lowland rainforest of New Guinea. And that's the view of the, the front door. And uh, there's a trail system around there. So we spend some time on foot looking for uh, these electric blue emperor fairy wrens, another rare species of fairy wren called the Wallace's fairy wren and after Alfred Wallace, and uh, it's a real spectacular one. There aren't many photos of this species ever taken. And mixed species flocks have all kinds of different things in them. Um, frilled monarch, that's a male on the left and a, and a female on the right. They're one of the more common flock leaders. And a variety of cuckoos as well. Again, New Guinea is really the cuckoo capital of the world. Um, passerines are so diverse and, and they've been around there for so long that the cuckoos have kind of followed suit in their, uh, in their diversity and, and abundance because they parasitize a different uh, passerine species. And um, just like, I don't know if anyone's ever birded in the Amazon, but you have a, there you have a flooded forest and, and a non-flooded forest. And, and you know the two communities have very different birds. It's actually the same thing in the lowland forests of New Guinea. And uh, so we do head out into the flooded forest and uh, put on our rubber boots and uh, muck around and uh, look for things like these uh, amazing common paradise kingfishers. And sometimes we get lucky and see these uh, colorful Papuan pittas hopping on the ground. And the flooded forest is also the home of uh, one of New Guinea's best birds, the uh, Sclater's crown pigeon. So absolutely spectacular bird again. This is uh, the largest pigeon in the world. It's actually turkey sized pigeon and uh, so colorful and with that elaborate head headdress. It's, um, it's always right at the very top of birds that people want to see in New Guinea. We do sometimes get really lucky and see them while we're walking around in the forest, but the more reliable way to see them is uh, just very slowly drifting along the tributaries and they actually feed right on the riverbanks. And so we sometimes see them walking around on the riverbanks or they'll, they'll flush up onto a low perch. And the night birding is excellent in this area as well. Um, marbled frogmouth. This is a, a rare, poorly known owl called the Papuan hawk owl. And then there's more owl at night jars to look for as well. Um, Wallace's owl at night jar and starry owl at night jar. So, so this one, um, a really spectacular species again. And this one's essentially only known from, from the area around that hut that, uh, that, that I showed you a picture of the other day. Um, a few minutes ago. So uh, yeah, this one's essentially only known from that very one small area. And in such a wilderness, there's lots of other interesting wildlife around. This is a great flying fox, the world's largest bat. And we see there's big camps of them. So they roost in, in trees along the river, right down to the tiny little sheep tail bats that roost on the underside of leaves. There's an endemic crocodile that still quite common in the river systems in this area, the New Guinea crocodile, and a variety of other, other things in the forest. Uh, I just put this picture of a tree snake in. Uh, th this was on a tour a couple of years ago. We found this quite brightly colored tree snake and you know we were just all kind of enjoying, enjoying watching it and, and uh, 
I asked one of the participants if he wouldn't mind just taking a picture of it while he had his camera out. And um, while I was trying to work out which species it was after I got home, I eventually found out that it's actually an undescribed species. So, you know, you can just go on a walk out the back door of that hut and see undescribed species. And um, another fun thing in this region is that the, the local guides, who they've really done an amazing job in this area. And they build a couple of blinds in, in, some, in some interesting spots. So this is a gigantic flightless rail. And um, it, it, it was basically a ghost. I mean, nobody, nobody knew how or where to see this bird. But the local guides in that area worked out that um, when they harvest sago, so that's, that's their main food crop, actually, the people that live out there. Are, are the these sago palms when they harvest these after they leave the rails come around and they start feeding on the leavings so now every year they build a blind where they're where they're working on the sago and uh often we can we can sit and wait in that blind and, and see this bird that was like a mythical bird gigantic flightless rail and we can just sit in the blind and, and watch them come around and feed and then uh this was the last bird i had for you i told you i was going to show you a brighter bower bird so um they often build a blind at one of the bowers of, of the flame bower bird. And um, it, it builds a fairly simple bower, always with uh, blue things. You can see the one blue berry there in the bower, uh, but it's an absolutely phenomenal bird. This is the brightest bird I've ever seen in the world. Like when you put your binoculars on this thing, you can literally almost blind yourself. It, it, I don't know if it really comes out in the picture, but this thing is extraordinary bright. And so it's, uh, it's probably my, my favorite bird down there, but um, so many, so many great experiences to be had in that in that lowland rainforest. It's uh, it's always an exciting uh, finale to the trip. And then when the female comes around, he'll he'll display. And um, yeah, you might have seen there was actually a Netflix documentary came out on these fairly recently, and that was that was shot in these same blinds that we uh, that we use when we're in this area. And um, yeah, so I'm going to leave it uh, on that one. And uh, I need to thank uh, some of my colleagues and, and par tour participants um, who've, uh, who've helped out with some slides here um, from, from my tours in, in New Guinea. And uh, final slide, we'll, uh, we'll open up for questions, but uh, yeah, you see our Rock Jumper website there. Um, very, easy to, very easy to use the website and my personal uh, email address. Anyone feel, uh, feel more than welcome to uh, Fire me off an email later on with any any questions about uh, my tours or Rock Jumper. So thank you very much, everyone. Well, clap everyone! Yay! <laughs> oh my gosh, Adam, that is absolutely spectacular. Um, I know probably the first thing that comes to mind is how do you ever come back? I mean, <laughs> I guess it's good that you have a little child now because it would be hard to ever leave this place. Um, so let me just say, does anyone have any questions? Let, let's try it first where you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. Let me, uh, let me go over to gallery view and see, does anyone have their hand raised? Does anyone have a question? Steve, I yes. look like you're, there we go. Okay, Steve? Um, could you comment on hummingbirds and cranes? In New Guinea? In New Guinea. Sorry, was the question on hummingbirds and cranes in New Guinea? Yes. Okay. Or um, in yeah. this area. Yeah, so New Guinea has no hummingbirds. So hummingbirds are, are only in North and South America. So New Guinea in the Australasian region has no hummingbirds. So what it does have, and I didn't put a picture of them, is uh, sunbirds. So in the areas that don't have hummingbirds, so that's Africa, Asia, and Australasia, you have many species of hummingbirds, which fill a similar ecological niche. They're very brightly colored, small nectar feeding birds. Um, they can't hover, they, can't, they don't fly as fast as a hummingbird, they can't hover, but they fill a similar ecological niche. So that's hummingbirds. As to cranes, um, New Guinea does actually have one, one species, the brolga, in the, in the very far south, um, which, which is more readily seen in, in Australia. So there is one species, the, the, the brolga crane, which is a huge, a huge one, um, but we won't see them on our, on our tours there. They're in a really inaccessible, I mean, it's all inaccessible in New Guinea, but, but they're down in the trans fly, which is a really seldom visited part of, of New Guinea. 
Fantastic. Thanks for your question, Steve. Anyone else have a question? Yes, I do. We went to Papua New Guinea very many years ago and enjoyed it immensely. And this is a wonderful presentation of what you might see. I'm wondering, when we were there, they were just beginning the palm oil and cutting down the tropical trees all around the coast. And I'm wondering how they're being preserved or what's happening. There was also gold, I think. Yeah, great. Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so due to its, you know, as you, as you know, due to its um, remoteness, ruggedness, New Guinea has one of the highest forest covers of any country in the world. I mean, until very recently, it, it was 90% of, of native forest um, cover. That is definitely slipping slowly um, in, in more recent decades, especially recent years. Um, in terms of what, what it's being converted to, um, there's definitely a lot of mining. Uh, mining has really increased a lot um, in, in recent years. With the palm oil, it, it's patchy. There are some places that, that the palm oil has started to come in. The island of New Britain, which is the big island that, that I showed you at the start um, off of New Guinea, there's a lot of palm oil in New Britain. Papua New Guinea itself has very little. Um, West Papua, it's West Papua, it's coming in. It's coming in. Um, yeah. So it it remains, it remains kind of one of the most remote, pristine places in the world. But we can see that slowly, slowly slipping. Yeah. It's amazing country and it's one of our very favorites. And we appreciate the culture there. And it what we found was that later we kind of studied up and that there are 42 major groups of languages in the world and Papua New Guinea has 24 of them. Yeah, and no, that's a great point. So it's not, it's not only that it has 20% of the languages in the world, it has actually, I didn't know it was that 50, it has almost half of the language groups. So you literally have tribes that live only a few miles away and they speak, you know, a language is different to each other than say we do to Swahili, you know, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And so they're isolated in those valleys. And that's what I saw that the, the birds of paradise were so isolated too, because they didn't have to go anywhere. And so that's how they evolved so many different species of paradise because these by isolated valleys developed humans that were speaking different languages from the other valleys. And so were the birds of paradise. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. And you, and you see a lot of connections between birds and, and humans in there as well. Like you'll notice, I mean, I didn't show a lot of the cultural pictures, but a, a lot of the tribes do actually dress themselves up to, to look like birds. So there, there are a lot of parallels between birds and, and, uh, and humans in New Guinea. Oh. Thanks. One other question. Yeah, oh, I was just gonna say thanks Juanita. I wanted to let everyone know that was Juanita Baker speaking, um, who also is part of the Pelican Island chapter. And now you know someone who's been there if anyone ha wants to have local, cool. local news. So Steve, go ahead with your question. Yeah, and what would be uh, the trip on your average trip list is, uh, is how many number, birds number on, of a, on an average trip? Uh, number of species would be around 300, um, 300 In 18 species. days? Yeah, 318 days. Oh. Um, yeah, so we do we do this this trip. We do also do a trip on on the other side, West Papua, which has quite a lot of the other ones that we don't see here. But I have to say, the, the West Papua trip is is more challenging. It's uh, the infrastructure is uh, is not even what it is in, in Papua New Guinea. But yeah, our our um, our birding in paradise will will usually see about 300 species, and um, typically I think it's. Uh, 22 birds of paradise that we get on that trip. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Nancy typed in a message. Um, she wanted to know if all of the species have been identified or if there's any bird that's known to be there but has not yet been observed or something that's not yet been observed but not identified. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, so there's, there's two ways of looking at that, right? I mean, there's genetically, 
with the DNA, we know there's going to be a number of species. I mean, every year, like one, one bird in New Guinea last year, the little shrike thrush got split into eight species. And so we know genetically there are, there are lots, of, uh, <laughs> lots of new species going to be coming. But in terms of something that's completely different, um, there's, nothing, there's nothing right now that's like definitely waiting to be described. That's like this big crazy thing. However, there, there are still um, a number of mountain, mountain areas that, you know, that no people live in and have never been surveyed. And it's, it's in these you know, remote mountain um, areas. And these are the ones that are apart from that central ridge, like they're separated, isolated mountain areas. And, and there's, there's some chance that, that there will be a new species in, in those. Um, there was that uh, famous expedition to the Foya Mountains in the, in the early 2000s that found all these new mammals and, and they did find a new bird, the Foya honey eater. So yeah, there are still mountain areas like that, which require sort of massive, massive expeditions to, so yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> Uh, so while we're waiting more for more questions to come in, I, I have two myself. Um, have you personally, you've obviously made quite a few trips there. Is there one bird that got away, the one that got away, one that you have been seeking, but you yourself have not yet observed? Yeah, well, New Guinea's, New Guinea's interesting. I mean, New Guinea definitely has a lot of the shyest, most difficult, most frustrating, most frustrating birds to see. So... <sighs> Fortunately, I've done I've done this tour often enough. Um, there's only one bird. Uh, there's only one bird on on this route that that I've never oh, seen. I'm it's still places listening. we go. I'm still my notes here. It's called the the Papuan whipbird, and I mean the Latin name of it is Androphobus, which means afraid of people. So I mean it's a super shy bird. Then there's also one in the West Papua side. It's called, it's an Astrapia, so it's a bird of paradise. And um, it's called the Arfac Astrapia. And it's the only bird that my wife has seen that I haven't, because we split up and we were hiking up there and she saw it and she showed me a picture of it later. And I've never, I still haven't seen it. So yeah, there's always, there's always, uh, you know, nobody's ever seen every bird in New Guinea and nobody ever will. There's always something to go back for. <laughs> Uh, all right. Before I go on to my second question, does anybody else have a question? Okay, I don't see anyone yet. So my, my second question is, um, of all of the known species, which one is the most endangered? Which ones, you know, would you say is the one that the, the least number or probably only a few left anywhere in the world that exists only there in New Guinea? Yeah, so that's that's another really interesting question. Um, so let me start out by saying that bird bird hunting is actually really common in New Guinea, and it's one of the reasons that um, birds are so shy. I mean, you know, in the 1800s there were there were hundreds of thousands of birds of paradise being shot and killed and, and sent to Europe every year. Um, but then there's also because mammals are scarce and hard to find. I mean, people the local people do and always have eaten a lot of birds. So it's, it's interesting in that bird hunting is actually quite heavy, but because there is still so much remaining forest, um, it, at this point, it still doesn't seem to have really adversely affected the population. So I might be wrong on this, but I don't think there's actually any bird in New Guinea that's officially considered critically endangered you know, by, by BirdLife International. Um, there's a couple with really small ranges on, on the tops of mountains that, that are, you know, endangered by range. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable that, um, that there's still really nothing that's kind of on the verge of extinction in, in the island. It just, again, attests to, to, to how remote and how rugged the place is. All right, another question that's come in. Um, can you tell, talk about the purpose of those, um, I think you call them bowers. The, the, you said they're not for nesting? Yeah, no, well, so they're, they're, they're not the nest. So people sometimes think, oh, does the female come and lay her egg here? No, so the female actually builds a nest in the forest like, like many other birds. It, it's, it's 
strictly to attract the female and then do a, a courtship display. So the male will, will build the bower and they usually build a new bower every year. And it's the purpose of it is strictly to attract the attention of a female. So, okay. Yeah. And it looks like Rob and Marnie have a question. I think I saw you guys pop in. Did you guys have a question? I do. So I saw you had the, I mean, all the birds are beautiful, of course, but you had the one that was on the river and you mentioned that it was easier to see when you're actually going on the rivers. Do, do you, as part of your tour, get in the rivers as well or hike, hiking through the forest and then getting, getting kayaks or? Yeah, it's, it's little like motorized canoes um, that we use ju just in that fly river area. So yeah, so, you know, we spend like three days in that area. So we spend part of our time walking on these narrow forest trails, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of hard work. Many of you have probably done tropical rainforest birding and it, it can be challenging, but then we spend quite a bit of the time, especially in the early mornings and, and late afternoons, just kind of drifting along these, these tributaries in, um, in these motorized canoes. So yeah, um, it, you know, it's not, you're not paddling your own kayak, but you're sitting in a, you're sitting in a, in a, in a, in a canoe, a motorized canoe. Wow. And that's usually very rewarding birding. Oh, well, sure. And relaxing. <laughs> and relaxing and easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Steve's asking, um, what's the level of government-sponsored ecotourism, and how would you say it compares to the way that Costa Rica does the government-sponsored ecotourism? Yeah. Good question. Um, so the government, the government has a pretty active um, hand in, in sort of advocating for birding tourism. But so, you know, Papua New Guinea is kind of, despite how remarkable it is, it's, it's off most people's radar. Um, so they, they have a tough, a tough job to get people to come there. Um, so there, people come for some of the cultural shows, but their main sources of, of tourism would be scuba diving and, and bird watching. Um, so the government, you know, the government is interested in it, but they they haven't they haven't quite reached that level yet where where there's a lot of people come in. You know, maybe that's a good thing, may, may, maybe not, but it would be nice to see more people coming and, and supporting the supporting the the local tourism infrastructure. And of course, you know, this year they won't have had a single a single tourist come and that's you know that's terrible news for for the local guides and it, it's hard you know there's not a lot of infrastructure there it's hard to keep these lodges running you know it's it's hard to get supplies in things are expensive so it's it's a challenging place for ecotourism i mean you know we we run rock jumper we run eight to ten tours a year there and it's it's certainly one of our more challenging destinations um, but it's, the birds are just so amazing. It's, but it's definitely nowhere on the level of, of Costa Rica or, or anything like that. Yeah. And what is their primary, um, um, products that they make or what, you know, I mean, taking birding off the, 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 uh, realm here, since it's not ecotourism, what is their primary, what is the primary is it fruit or what do they export? What's their the products of the nation. Yeah, so so New Guinea is still probably close to eighty, maybe even ninety percent subsistence living. So um, just you know, ag agriculture, much like it was ten thousand years ago. Um, just people have cell phones now, but uh, <laughs> but the the primary export for, for New Guinea is, uh, is is minerals. It's it's a mining country. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm taking a quick scan. I see nothing else in chat. Um, I'm going up and down. Does anyone else have a question? You can either raise your hand or put the little hand up. Um, uh, Steve is asking, do you fly to each lodge? How do you travel from one lodge to another? Yeah, yeah, we do fly. Um, again, there's very few roads. So um, we do about uh, four or five flights during the course of the trip. And they're all sort of one hour flights. Um, but yeah, we basically fly to each lodge. All right, so I'm going to do one last quick scan. So anyone else have a question? I'm just scanning to see if anyone's got their hand raised. Anything else in chat? Uh, oh, Nancy, I see you. Oh, no, you're clapping. So <laughs> uh, 
can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, how many how many do you normally take on your tour group? Um, for New Guinea, uh, it's usually between six to ten. Okay. Six to ten people. And, and Adam, I'll ask the question. I mean, this is something I know changes day by day. Um, when uh, has there been any indication of, of starting to think about a month where trips will be open there again? Are you guys starting to temporarily or provisionally, you know, lay out an agenda for anything next year? Or yeah, still... so so one thing that I that I didn't mention is that. Um, all, all of the, the birding tours to New Guinea are during the dry season there. So that is uh, essentially May, really June, June to September, June to September. Um, so yeah, that means, you know, the entire year this year was, uh, was a write-off. Uh, so we are going ahead with the assumption that we'll be able to run tours in, in New Guinea next year, although obviously no one knows for sure. There have been very, very few uh, cases of COVID reported in New Guinea, but it's also a place where, you know, probably no one's been tested. Um, so yeah, the, at the moment, the country is, is remain closed. Um, but yeah, we're, we're sort of proceeding on the, on the idea that uh, we'll be running tours there in come May or June and yeah. Oh, well, Thank you so much. Um, oh, Juanita has one more question. Has climate change, um, how has climate change impacted Papua New Guinea? Yeah, climate change, interesting question. Um, they have glaciers there, right? Yeah, the glaciers are melting and you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that, that the glaciers aren't gonna just completely melt. That's the way they're certainly headed. Um, no, some of these some of these mountain birds that, that only live on a few mountains on the tops of a few mountains those might well you know just run out of run out of territory long term um and you know with the impacts are probably more with the local people um i was there oh, a couple of years ago there was and i mean you get seasonal yearly changes and all this but a couple of years ago it's a very wet country, New Guinea. It's one of the wettest places in the world. But I was there this one year and, and we had like over a month when it was just blue sky every day. And at first I thought, oh, this is fantastic. But actually the birds became really quiet and really hard to find. And then what was happening at night, because um, there were no cloud cover, it was getting really cold and people's crops were freezing and, and people were running out of food. And, you know, and there have been intensifying you know, a lot of their water to drink and, and use comes from rainwater. There have been some some periods of drought. So yeah, it's 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 too early to uh, it's probably too early to uh, to say for sure. But I have been to one I, one of the offshore islands of New Guinea called Nisan Atoll, and that's that's the first place I've been where I saw like climate refugees because there. It's, it's just a, a foot or two above ground level. And I mean, the island is still above water level, but the seawater has actually infiltrated like their groundwater. So they, they can't really grow, uh, grow vegetables there anymore. So that's Nissan Atoll. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, change is coming. And we need to ask a very interesting follow-up question. Does cannibalism still exist that you know of anywhere in Papua New Guinea? Yeah, no, cannibalism. I think the last confirmed one was in the 1930s. Um, but so there's no, there's no cannibalism anymore, but uh, it's still, uh, it's still a very tribal. I mean, people go to, go to war all the time there. If, uh, if I steal your pig, somebody's going to come back and, and uh, you know, I, I better watch my back. <laughs> and, and people it's it's still uh it's still a very tribal thing but but uh you know it's it's nothing to put sort of birders off there <laughs> they, they they'll literally be going around with their bows and arrows and they'll stop and smile and wave at you and uh uh yeah but the cannibalism is uh is long gone <laughs> oh, not that long it was 1930s i guess that's not that long ago <laughs> that's true <laughs> uh so there's several comments about spectacular pictures wonderful information thank you very much for uh, an outstanding presentation um so i'm just going to give last call to anyone else to see if anyone else has any questions check the chat real quick 
Indeed. It looks like we're good. Um, so normally, um, Adam, this is where I um, shake your hand and hand you a gift. But since we can't do that, um, um, Jeff, our treasurer, is going to be sending you a little packet uh, that you should see in, hopefully here soon in the mail um, out there in, in California. But we, we, on behalf of the entire Space Coast Audubon Group, thank you so much for sharing this information, um, especially at a time when we all need to be taken away from where we are and we physically can't go. So um, it's just absolutely spectacular to see these birds. And I personally can't wait till I, I get to see them in person. So round of of applause everyone thank you very much adam awesome. uh, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. it was it was my pleasure and uh yeah i have been out to Merritt island a couple times out in your neck of the woods so i know you guys live in a pretty special place but uh yeah it was my pleasure to uh to, to do that talk for you guys thanks for listening well, and I will honestly say that we will welcome you here anytime that you'd like to come back, Adam. It's yeah, our I'll pleasure as well. Bring the daughter. <laughs> Absolutely. There you go. Uh, so a couple last quick announcements. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that as I checked um, last night or this morning it looks like just a couple more spots available for tomorrow so if you were thinking uh, if you happen to have joined earlier um, you missed what Bert was saying there was only going to be one group and it was full we took a wait list cleared the wait list and now there's a few groups because it's going to be two separate groups so it's still going to be groups of 10 only and all the COVID prot protocols will be in place but there are a few spots available you have to sign up ahead of time so please go in to, to meet up register for the or a wetlands trip tomorrow if you want to go read all the COVID protocols including bringing your mask um, and that way all those questions are answered and then also just wanted to let you know um, that David and I are working D David and I sorry are working on an eBird class finalized the details so there will be an eBird class where we will be doing the the class virtually so on zoom just like this and then um after that we're going to do some special ways of getting your field practice in um so look forward to that and that will be announced on meetup as well and i'm just taking a look to make sure i got all of the other announcements in i think i did any other questions from anybody before we close for the evening Comments? Any other? I know a couple people talked about they uh, went out to see the cinnamon teal and the Franklin's goal. Any other special sightings? I'm not seeing anyone shake anything. So get out and bird tomorrow. Enjoy the wonderful weather. Very happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Hope to either see you on the trip tomorrow. I hope to welcome you all back in December for when we're going to go to the last frontier and we'll be birding in Alaska. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Bye. Thanks, Michelle. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Rochelle. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Juanita. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for joining.